Hello and welcome to Nursing Emergencies Renal Failure. This is part of the Nursing Emergencies program. My name is David Woodruff. I am the editor of Critical Care Nursing Med Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. So let's talk a little bit about renal failure and starting off with our acute renal failure. So before we get into that, we need to talk a little bit about the risks for renal dysfunction. In order to identify renal failure in our patients, especially with acute renal failure, we want to be looking for those risks. So these are the things that are going to make this patient at higher risk for developing this dysfunction. Age, the very young and the very old have less control over their immune response and inflammation and they can tend to develop more renal dysfunction. Shock, obviously, could cause damage to the nephron, the glomerulus there, and we can end up with renal dysfunction. Vasopressors, we cause vasoconstriction. We're not only decreasing the perfusion to some of the other organs in the body, but we're also decreasing the perfusion to the kidneys. Volume depletion and nephrotoxic drugs, both of those things can cause damage directly to the nephron. And then we have diabetes and hypertension. We have long heard about how the long-term effects of uncontrolled diabetes and hypertension can scar the tissue in the kidney and cause renal dysfunction and renal failure. Renal failure can be of one of three different varieties, whether this is acute or chronic, and in most cases, chronic renal failure is the result of untreated or poorly treated acute renal failure. Intrarenal type glomerular dysfunction or damage means that we have damage occurring directly to the nephron itself. So it's deep inside the kidney and into that functional unit of the nephron. Prerenal dysfunction means we have a mean arterial pressure for some reason that has been decreased. Now this could be due to a lack of fluid. So that maybe the patient has hypovolemic shock. It could also be due to some renal artery constriction or maybe some renal artery stenosis that is decreasing the blood flow going to the kidney. And then we have decreased flow getting to the nephron and we're not perfusing. Not only aren't we perfusing and has infiltration occur, but we're also not perfusing the kidney itself. Postrenal means we have urinary obstruction. So we're obstructing the ureter, urine backs up into the kidney, causes pressure on, unfortunately, causes a, a bad pressure on the kidney, reverse pressures on the filter. So we're not getting the filtration that we should normally have. So as we work our way through this nephron here, and we take a look at these again, we have our pre-renal, which means not enough blood flow. So now you can see the blood is coming in here to our nephron. This is the filtration area, number one there. This is where filtration occurs. If we don't have enough blood flow coming into the nephron, there won't be enough force favoring filtration, and there won't be enough perfusion occurring in order to maintain homeostasis. At the same time, we're not getting enough blood flow going into the kidney to perfuse the kidney itself, and we could have damage that's occurring. So not only do we have decrease in our filtration, but we also have damage directly occurring to the nephron. Interrenal means that we have damage that's occurring to that filtration device. So now we're having damage that is occurring inside here in the glomerulus. We're actually scarring the filter. So think about it like having a coffee filter. If you punch a bunch of holes in the coffee filter, it's not going to filter very well. Thirdly, we have postrenal, which is obstruction of urine flow. Urine backs up into that glomerulus up there. Now there's too much pressure for the filter to have to filter against, and we don't have adequate filtration. Renal failure will first go into this oligeric phase where we have decreased urine output. So we normally associate this by having the decreased urine output, but you notice there's all of these other symptoms here, and this is just the top 10, nausea and vomiting, and that's occurring because those electrolytes are building up in ways they shouldn't be. Decreased level of consciousness related to our decrease in our sodium level. 
GI bleeding, asterixis, as we're starting to build up those proteins in the blood, those proteins are irritating and they cause asterixis, which is also called liver flap. Have the patient hold their arm out straight in front of you and pull the fingers back so that the palm is up and showing. And what will happen is that the hand will flap. This is the result of neuromuscular irritability as a result of having too much protein in the fluid that's not being filtered out. So we're building up those ammonias and other results of protein metabolism. An increase in potassium. As potassium increases and as we're starting to build up fluid and we're not able to filter it out, the kidneys are going to dump off sodium. So they try to dump off sodium in an attempt to try to dump off that potassium and the extra water. It doesn't help a whole lot, obviously, or we wouldn't have the increase in potassium, but the end result is a low sodium, and that's what causes our decrease in level of consciousness. Acidosis also occurs, so we're going to see cardiac dysrhythmias, Kuzmal's respirations, which are fast rapid respirations in an attempt to try to blow off some of that CO2 and correct that metabolic acidosis. Hypervolemia is the result of hanging out of all this fluid, which then results in edema and hypertension. So our treatment will be dialysis, fluid restrictions, and renal diet. The next phase is the diuretic phase. And in the diuretic phase, this is a good sign because it indicates that the kidneys are starting to heal. However, during the diuretic phase, even though we see lots of urine output, the kidneys still aren't filtering. We have damage to that filter. Remember again, like punching holes in a coffee filter. We can see lots of fluid coming through, but we're not filtering the way that we normally should. So the patient may be unable to concentrate the urine or be able to filter out the wastes in the way that they should. Unfortunately though, we can have an excess excretion of potassium and the patient can actually end up with a low potassium level at this point. So our symptoms could be hypovolemia, hypotension, and electrolyte imbalances, and we're still doing dialysis because the patient can't get those waste products out, but we may have to do volume replacement and may actually have to replace some of these electrolytes like potassium. So here's what the course looks like. We have the initiation phase there with a sudden increase in BUN and creatinine. And then we get into this maintenance phase where the BUN and creatinine is severely high. As the patient goes into the recovery phase, so the first part of this is diuretic, and you can see that really steep drop off in the BUN and creatinine, but then slowly over weeks to months during that recovery phase, the BUN and creatinine come back down to normal. Another thing to keep in mind about the BUN and creatinine elevation is that when we look at this in relationship to creatinine clearance, so BUN and creatinine start to elevate when we've lost about 75% of our renal function. So we're all the way down there to the 25 mark, 25% 25 of renal function left, and that's where the BUN and creatinine start to rise. Notice though that the creatinine clearance and our estimated creatinine clearance and GFR are going to start to change as the renal function starts to change. So even when we're starting to lose renal function out there at the 175, 50 mark, way before BUN and creatinine rise, we're gonna see changes in creatinine clearance and see changes in our GFR. Those are the early warning signs. And in fact, we don't really get high elevations in BUN and creatinine until the patient has lost 90% of the renal function. So we're down to 10% renal function left here when that BUN and creatinine actually get really high. Well, if our acute renal failure does not resolve, then it's going to become chronic renal failure. At this point, we're going to see it go through these different phases here. The first of which is called decreased renal reserve. So in the process, we're seeing a decrease in the number of functioning nephrons, and we're starting to see that BUN and creatinine rise. At this point in time, the patient may not have symptoms. We're just starting to see an asymptomatic increase in BUN and creatinine. And probably the patient won't need to have any further intervention unless...
they have some kind of a stressor, some other hit on the kidney, maybe sepsis, for example, that stresses the kidney, and now that decreased number of functioning nephrons is not enough to maintain normal renal function. So then we move into renal insufficiency. This is an in asymptomatic increase in BUN and creatinine. So now we're seeing those go up. It's asymptomatic, which means the patient may not even know about it. So they're not running off to the doctor saying, hey, wait a minute, my BUN and creatinine are high. They may not even know it until they get to a, the physician. And for some reason, the physician does a full workup and says, hey, your BUN and creatinine are high. This is now the renal insufficiency stage. This is where the patient may have some lifestyle changes, et cetera, to try to maintain their renal function. Now we move into renal failure, and we have a symptomatic increase in BUN and creatinine. At this point, the patient may need to have some intervention. Maybe we have some intermittent dialysis, or while the patient's in the hospital, they may even have continuous renal replacement therapy, CRRT. When the patient reaches the stage of end-stage renal disease, this is the patient that needs chronic hemodialysis. So hemodialysis allows for the rapid removal of our waste products and fluids. However, it requires vascular access. So, and it also requires some systemic heparinization, even though we try to keep it in the tubing as much as possible, that blood is going back into the patient's body. So some side effects could include bleeding, cardiovascular instability as we're moving lots of electrolytes and fluids around, hypotension and dysrhythmias. A more gentle approach is to use continuous renal replacement therapy, and this is like a long-term dialysis. So rather than pulling off a whole bunch of fluid over a period of a couple hours, now continuous renal replacement therapy is done for maybe 12 hours, 16 hours a day. It's a continuous therapy. This is typically done in the intensive care unit. Still requires systemic heparinization, Side effects could include clotting of the filter, blood loss in the system, potential for hypovolemia if we pull off too much fluid. However, this does allow for a varied rate of removal, which may be better tolerated by our critical care patients. So some of our takeaways include acute renal failure, must damage about 75% of the nephrons prior to symptoms occurring. So don't count on symptoms first, Let's be looking for that change in GFR. Watch for the risk factors and the subtle changes in renal function. Dialysis and CVVHD, that's continuous venal venous hemodialysis, are used to protect the kidney from additional harm and remove the waste products. Healthy nephrons will hypertrophy in order to be able to maintain renal function, and this is why oftentimes we don't see that there has been damage occurring until almost all of the renal function has decreased. Well, thank you for joining me for Nursing Emergencies Renal Failure. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time, bye now.